It's Tuesday, ladies and gentlemen. You know what that means. It's time for another edition of D2 Tuesday here exclusively on the Inner Circle YouTube channel. My name is Victor Anderson. We got a lot to get into today, ladies and gentlemen. You know where you can find the Inner Circle on your favorite social media platforms. Make sure you hit that subscribe button. Turn on your notifications so you don't miss any videos coming up here on our YouTube page today. The NFCA preseason top 25 is out. I will share my thoughts on the poll. And we will talk to one of the coaches in the top 10 of that poll on this particular episode. But before we get into any of that, we do want to make a couple of announcements. Coming up on next week, it will be our D2 Tuesday season preview. Eric Lopez will join me to talk about the storylines that I'll be looking forward to the most in this 2024 Division II season as the road to Longwood officially will begin a week and change from now. Plus, we will have several interviews coming out next Tuesday, both in a podcast format and exclusively on our YouTube channel. So follow us, follow in the Circle SB on your social media of choice to verify what coaches will be joining us on D2 Tuesday. But the NFCA preseason poll came out as of 12 o'clock on the dot today. And no real surprise, the defending national champion Nighthawks led by Mike Davenport on the unanimous number one team in the nation coming off a program record 64 wins. And their second straight national championship, including a championship series sweep over Grand Valley State, who falls into the number two position. Uh, Deanna Callahan and company uh, went 8 and 0 in the postseason before falling those two games to North Georgia. They do lose a lot of star power in that lineup, but Coach Callahan will have her Lakers ready to make another run for the title in 2024. Central Oklahoma, the Bronchos will start the season as the number three team in the nation. They themselves with a program record, 54 victories a year ago. West Texas A&M, who got knocked off in Super Regionals, come in at number four. And Julie LaMare and the South Super Regional champion, Nova Southeastern Sharks, round out the top five. By the way, ladies and gentlemen, before I get to the 6-10, to 10, Coach LaMare will be one of the coaches to be on our D2 Tuesday season preview next week. For you fans of the Shark Tank, the softball version, govern yourselves accordingly. 6-10 to 10 goes with like this. East Stroudsburg and Jamie Wolback comes in at number 6. The Warriors with the greatest season in program history. School record and wins first Atlantic Super Regional appearance, first national tournament appearance. They come in at number six. Cal State San Marcos with Steph Ewing comes in at seven. UT Tyler comes in at eight. Wilmington, number nine. And Tampa, who spent the last half of the season, the number one team in the nation before getting knocked off by Nova Southeastern in the South Super Regionals. They come in at number 10. So the top 10, North Georgia, Grand Valley State. Central Oklahoma, West Texas A&M, Nova South Eastern, East Stroudsburg, Cal State San Marcos, UT Tyler, Wilmington, and Tampa. What that means, ladies and gentlemen, is that in the second week of the season, we will see a matchup of two top 10 teams in Florida as Nova South Eastern will host the number six ranked Warriors of East Stroudsburg. And for Coach Jamie Wallback and her team, 2023, was a phenomenal season for them. Making it, as I referenced, won the Atlantic Regional. In spite of getting eliminated early in the PSAC tournament, won Super Regionals after losing in the first game to a very stingy ball club in Charleston. But they rallied back, won the final two games, and made it to Chattanooga. Last week, I had the honor and opportunity to catch up with Coach Wallback about the season and the expectations her Warriors will have 
going into 2024. Here now, my conversation on D2 Tuesday with E. Strasburg, head coach, Jamie Walbach. All right, folks, so our first interview on D2 Tuesday is with a coach who, um, let's just say, is had a pretty good 2023, 44 wins, first Atlantic Region Championship, first NCAA Championship appearance and win as well, and is primed for bigger and better things in 2024. Of course, we're speaking of East Strasburg head coach Jamie Wolvac joining us here on D2 Tuesday. How you doing, coach? Doing great. Thanks for having me. Uh, needless to say, uh, last year was a kind of a magic carpet ride for your program. If we kind of highlighted the big points, the 44 wins, making it to Chattanooga. What has been the mood like for your team as you're starting those initial preparations to 2024 and hopefully a return trip to the uh, championship festival in Florida? Yeah, sir. I mean, of course, uh, those that, you know, have been there, done it last year, uh, you know, we, we talk about a little bit, but we also have to focus on 24 that's in the past. You know, they had a really good experience and, you know, we really laid the foundation to some excellent success moving forward. But at the same time, we have a lot of work to do. Um, you know, it's not easy anytime you get uh, to be able to, you know, enjoy that ride. It, it's a hard process and every game, you know, matters. And, you know, especially when you get in that crunch time, when it's conference play, everybody's bringing their best game. Um, and, and it's a dog fight. You know, our conference is really tough. So, um, you know, there's no game you ever walk into and be like, oh, that's so and so we can beat them. Like we have to come with our best selves uh, physically, mentally and emotionally to prepare for the games. And I know navigating through the PSAC, which has always been known to have stiff competition, particularly in the postseason, how much does that kind of help you prepare and serve you well for postseason, particularly what you had to go through last year? Sure. Well, our conference is tough. So, you know, everybody we play in conference, uh, like I said, there's not one easy game. You have to bring your best. Um, but it's fun because, you know, the players get to know us as a coaching staff and the players have their, you know, program they really want to beat. So it, it's pretty easy to get the players up um, to compete against the PSAC team because our conference is so competitive. They have friends in the conference. They have teammates that may have, they may have played club ball with. And for myself, I have a role model in the conference, Judy Laws at Kutztown. Um, you know, she's kind of been there, done that, and had some success, and I played for her. So, you know, there's that rival, but there's that sense of love, too. So, um, you know, when we're playing against them. But our, our players get up for PSAC games. Uh, it's a, it's an awesome conference to to play and end coaching. Yeah, Kutztown, Shippensburg, and Westchester. It's almost like, you as your reference coach, every week in conference, you got to bring your A game for those particular teams, especially with how the conference tournament turned out last year, where sure. we're thinking, okay, it's going to be, it's going to go one way. And then at the <laughs> end of the tournament, it ends up something completely different when ship sure. is working. I'm like, wait, what? Sure. Yeah. It was fun to see, like, you know, we, we tied regular season for uh regular season champs with Westchester. Um, but Shippensburg won the conference and then we succeeded on the back end, you know, to the World Series. So that's how competitive our conference is. We had three, you know, kind of three teams up there all kind of fighting for that one spot. And we just happened to gel at the right time and peak in the right moments and, you know, make that crucial play, whether it be, you know, runners on base and make that big defensive play where maybe in the past we kind of panicked with the pressure. We just kind of had everything, you know, work out, uh, you know, in our favor to to make it happen and, and get the win when we needed it. Yeah, and I know last year with the exit from the with the PSAC tournament, how it, it didn't end how you wanted it to end. What was kind of that mentality for your team as you got into regionals? Not only the hosting aspect of it, once you found that out, but kind of just flushing that from your memory and focusing on the important season that was taking place and knowing that you were going to get a chance to host. Sure. I think that ignited them, you know, the, the outcome in the, in the peace acts for us, we had a tough outing um, in our first game. And I think that just kind of ignited them, you know, to compete. But I also think uh, receiving the bid to host, which, you know, we owe, we owe a lot of kudos to our athletics director to be able to put that in. Cause we've got last minute we're thinking, wow, we're, you know, uh, ranked number one in the region. I don't know if we can hold on to that. And then we continue to, but we've never hosted before. You know, it's the most successful season that we've had. So I kind of knocked on the door and I said, Hey, can you put a bid in for us? It was like 24 hours before it's due. And he's like, no. 
And then 24 hours later, he gives me a call and said, I put it in. So I think, you know, uh, when you have that much success, it's not just about your players and your coaches, but it's your support staff as well. And that's why I'm saying, like, we peaked all at the right moment where everybody just saw us continuing to get better, even from that PSAC tournament, still receiving, you know, uh, an Atlantic region, uh, number one in the region as our ranking. I think everything was just – we were just getting so much support from all areas, um, not just the players and, and coaches, but also our support staff. And and when you get that much support and our players are recognized that, you want to compete for somebody, somebody bigger than yourself and play for your – for your program and not necessarily the name on your back, but the name on the chest. And I think that's what happened. You know, it ignited a, a whole nother level of heart in our game and, and we thrive off of heart and work ethic. Um, and I think we we're capitalized on that as a team. And your team last year was just, was just doing all the things right. Hitting sure. for average, the, the, the speed, I was so impressed with the stolen bases, the advancing the runners, is that kind of the philosophy of your program in terms of continuing to put pressure on teams with the speed and the running game and having the power complemented when it's available? Sure. I mean, as a coach, we try to recruit a very diverse lineup. I don't believe in just like all or nothing or just home run hitters. So I think as a lineup, we've got contact power and speed. Um, you know, my, my, I love to train catchers and I love to see holes in a catcher as our opponent. So Anytime we could put the pressure on the catcher um, from not only the physical standpoint, but the mental standpoint, we're going to excel in that area. Um, but as a whole, I think we have a very diverse lineup and a diverse, you know, uh, staff and, and player out on the field. Um, but that's just the way we recruit. I don't I don't like, you know, to be heavy on power hitters or heavy on speed. I, I like a little bit of everything. And I think that's where, you know, every year you try to get better. And it's like, well, what tools do we need? Well, last year we need a little bit of power. So we went after a transfer that had some power. Or, hey, we need a, a, a catcher who can get some runners out. So this year we, you know, brought in more catching. Not, not so much for this year, but for our future years, we're projecting ahead, right? Um, so I think when you can kind of recruit all the tools that you need based on the year before, what were we missing that we couldn't get to the top? So I think, you know, as a program, you continue to succeed as you fill those areas that are needed. And it's really about kind of having those leaders in the club in the, and not only in the on the field, but in the locker room and kind of setting those examples. And of course, Paige Zygman is the first name that I think of of what she's done, not just in the circle, but kind of being kind of one of the faces of your program. How important has Paige been to getting ESU to where they are right now, what they hope to be uh, this season? Sure. Well, I mean, she's phenomenal. To see her grow over the last couple of years and what she's done has been amazing. You know, just – Every pitcher in the circle, you know, it's not just about like the skills and them throwing, but it's also like just, you know, training the brain that you're good and the confidence that comes with it. And, you know, Paige is one of those players that will run through a wall for you. Like I could be sitting here right now talking to you and I guarantee you Paige is down at the gym working out. Right. And the team's not down there. So she's that type of kid that's going to put in the extra work. So to see her succeed at the level that she did and and really, I mean, kind of carry the team on her back in the pitching circle, along with some support staff. It's really cool to see that, you know, the kid that's, you know, out down at the gym working out by herself or in the in the, you know, in the field house, throwing another bullpen without a coach in there. It's cool to see that, you know, she excelled and and was able to, you know, get the most out of what she wanted to do. Um, I think also, it comes to support staff too, yes. right? You got you need to be competitive in the bullpen. So whoever she's next to, like she wants to beat them. But her her mentality is like she always wants to get better. She always wants to compete. But if you talk to her, she's kind of shy and she's very humble. So you know, it's just like if we could have five or ten pages, I think would be in a really good place. Um, she's hard. You know, it, it's hard to find a player like Paige. Is it, for a coach to have somebody like Paige, is it easier for you to coach somebody like her who does all the extra work outside of practice and outside of those workout sessions? Uh, I mean, yeah, that's great. Sometimes that's not a good thing for some players. They could overtrain on poor skills just because you're getting the reps in doesn't mean they're quality reps, yeah. right? Um, but, you know, for someone like Paige, she wants it. She puts in the work. Uh, she hits the weight room. She does it all. Um, and they're they're hard to find, but uh, she's an excellent, excellent uh, athlete, and she's going to have big shoes to fill, you know, for her future classes to try to find somebody like Paige. She's she's also, you know, we don't, we're talking about the skill and her performance, but, you know, what really gets Paige going that makes her a great player is she's as good as her teammates. And I mean that, like, truly, 
because when she feels supported um, and feels the love from her teammates, she's going to give them everything. And that's what we had right from a teammate and player personnel. She had a really good group of players support her that pushed her to be as good as she is. And that's that's some some of the reason why we went as far as we did. You know, when you get that personnel accurate with your team and your teammates love each other, um, you know, and you don't have a teammate saying, well, I hope that kid fails or I hope this kid's not playing or how oh, she struck out, whatever it may be. When you have that, you got a little bit of negative energy pulling the team down. And we didn't have any negative energy. And that's what really pushed us to the next level. We and, played as a team and it showed. Yeah. And I think the run that you had last year, starting with hosting regionals for the first time and the, com- the East Stroudsburg community, I feel kind of really rallied around your team when you found out you were going to be hosting, of course, credit to your athletic director for putting in that bid, even though it was a little bit late, almost towards, sure. the, towards the deadline. How important was that community to kind of come out, rally around your team, and get you through the that Atlantic Regional and knock off Westchester, West Virginia, Wesleyan, and Bowie State to advance to those Super Regionals? Sure. Like I said, I, we didn't win it ourselves. We had a lot of uh, support, but... Um, I think we've been trying to build that over the years, whether we had a bad season or a good season, um, we really focus on the community and building softball. So, you know, we have our camp and clinic season and that's, you know, to develop athletes, but also, you know, we also uh, not just, you know, develop athletes or give them a good experience or kind of show them campus on a clinic day, but we also bring in kind of like a featured player that's been there, done it, is on the USA team. So we bring those kind of names to ESU and it builds the softball community. So everyone's like, wow, like I, I want to go see what ESU is doing. Let's go check them out. We also have, um, you know, a unique situation where we have a partnership with uh, Strasburg Little League. Um, you know, so when we're coming out of practice, we've got these little eight, 10 year olds, 12 year olds coming into our practice, right? So that's really cool to share that experience. And some of that also extends to our assistant coach. Our assistant coach, Erica Molinero, was also a part of the Little League prior to our field being a turf field. But she's got little sisters participating in Little League, um, you know, and her dad is coaching. So it's a family environment. It, it just it, it really extends past just our team. Um, we do have the community support and um, family support, and it really extends outside of just ESU alone. And and that's why, you know, things are pretty cool here because it's, it's, it's a lot of fun to, to be a, a softball player or a coach uh, with ESU because we really take pride in the spirit of being a warrior. And what's so remarkable, Coach, when I was following you on social media, you were tweeting about your clinic. You say you got Sierra Romero. I'm like, wait, what? You got Sierra Romero. And then next <laughs> thing you know, I'm seeing you got a clinic with Montana Fouts. And I'm like, okay. Yeah. That, that kind of lets you, that kind of let me know that y'all are taking things very, very seriously at ESU in terms of <laughs> bringing in those marquee players sure. and letting, the, letting those participants know, hey, if you do the work, you can be like her and, or you can be, sure. you can be a part of our program in the process. Sure. Just puts that role model on a stage where they deserve it to be here, you know, and just share that dream with all these young ones coming up. Um, And then just on top of it, like I said, we're trying to build a softball community here, not just BSU softball. We're not just one entity. We're the entire university. We're building a family. We're building a team. We're building just the love of the game, right? So it's not like you just are a softball player here. The balance that they have, we, we take them to, you know, we have to do a lot of fundraising stuff. We take them to football games. Um, you know, we, we take them to all sorts of things. So I just think like as a whole, you come out of here as a better person and, and ready for the real world when you graduate from ESU softball. It's bigger than just the game. Um, so I think, uh, you know, it, it speaks for itself with what we do and we put it out there on social media to just share with everybody what we're doing. And it's not, like I said, just about softball. It's it about kind of opportunities. Is, yeah, it's building that app, it's making sure that they're more than just a softball player and not giving them that foundation that once they leave BSU that they have the tools necessary to succeed in whatever field that they decide to partake in once their softball career does come to an end, because not a lot of athletes in the vision, not a lot of athletes in softball in general are able to advance their career to that next level. So it's kind of building those foundational steps to make them successful going forward. Absolutely. And coach, I think the biggest thing that I thought about the super regionals with Charleston and for full disclosure, coach, <laughs> The Charleston head coach, Michelle Frew, I knew her from back when I broadcasted her games at Rollins. So sure. I was kind of torn between, okay, do I want East Strasburg to win or do I want my, my former head coach to win? So you lose game one to Charleston. 
you know, have if they're facing elimination game two, what was kind of the mindset of the team going into that elimination circumstance after falling in game one? Sure. Well, I think, you know, our team really wanted it. And in, in a sense, Charleston kind of helped feed, feed the warrior. Um, you know, we've got a little bit of a walk from the parking lot down to the softball field on day two. Uh, you know, they, Charleston was feeling good. They just won the first game, right? They're feeling good. They got to win one more to get there. And they're kind of celebrating a little bit on their walk down. Um, you know, just kind of like very cheery. And it, it kind of ignited our team. Like, what? They didn't even make it yet. Like, let's go. And that just, like, between that and then one of our other assistant coaches, uh, Coach Bo Vicendis, he's got this little thing with the girls, you know, like, to harden up, be tough. And what he does is he makes them take a lemon with the outside completely on, with the peel on and all, mm -hmm. and just bite into it. So he's like, he brought the lemons that day. He didn't have them on day one. He brought them day two. And just between that, you know, and being home, it, it just, thankfully, somehow, some way, skill, luck, it all kind of just come together, um, and, and they played their hearts out. Um, you know, and, and one thing that sticks out of my mind, you know, Paige Zygman did what she's done all season and dominated and did a very good job. But we had a player, uh, Lee Jenkins, that was a pitcher. She battled an injury uh, her entire last two years. Um, not sure if you know this, but it had nothing to do with the coaches that are there now. It's a totally different program, but she was a transfer from, from Charleston. So she pitched the last game of that day. And she wanted it so bad, and she pitched the best game of her life. It was the best game I've ever seen her pitch her entire career, and we talk about it often in the office. We reflect on that a lot, like, man, how'd she do that? She just, you know, she threw that screwball, put it on the hand. She kept it tight. She's got some speed. She went seven innings. She usually closes a game or throws three or four. Her adrenaline took over. She wanted it bad. Um, and, and that, you know, we just had everything in our favor. Like, how do you line up playing Charleston in that game where it's our transfer, you know, from there? So it's just everything lined up and it was a perfect ending. It was so remarkable because I remember kind of watching the broadcast and under hearing that storyline, I'm like, oh, so that's who is Charles is facing with <laughs> everything on the line. And, for her, to, yeah, by the way, seven, she went seven innings, nine strikeouts, only allowed four hits, and a remarkable performance for her. So sure. you get the lead, you one out away, you get that final out, and correct me if I'm wrong, Coach, but you're the first East Stroudsburg program in any sport to make it to the national tournament, to make it to the, to the national tournament. Oh, no, we have a lot of success here. No, yes, I for, please, forget, please forgive me because I know we, your we've got, a, we've got a field hockey team that just won a national championship. Yes. Uh, we've got lacrosse that went to the Final Four. Uh, we've got our men's basketball team that went to the Sweet Eight. Um, and, you're, and, you're, and they're nationally ranked in the top 15 again this year. They are. So I, 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 those are the ones I could speak for right now, just in a, you know, just quick in the, in the back of my mind. But it's possible, you know, we, we, wrestling is a unique animal. We've had all Americans go to national, you know, events for, for wrestling. Um, but uh, I, it's just, it's, it's fun now because our hallway has all the coaches and our athletics director and senior women administrator. So we can like join the club now, right? Yes. Like, <laughs> we can finally say, well, we're there too. But, you know, we do have unfinished business. It's great to get there, but we want to win it. We have an ultimate goal to be a national championship championship team, and, and we have not um, completed that task yet. Yeah, I know when you got to uh, Chattanooga, you took on the eventual national champions, North Georgia, in the first game, played them tough. You beat Nova Southeastern, which you're going to have a run back, which I'll talk about shortly before you fall to Texas Tyler. Amongst the disappointment that happened last year with not – getting to that ultimate goal, winning the national championship. What can you take from last season and build on it for 2024, understanding that you want to – you take the lessons from last year and now build on it and can't not reflect on the past because this is an entirely new team, new experiences. But what, what lessons can you take from this past season and apply for 2024 to kind of – to finish the story, so to speak? Well, I think every year when we're, you know, in our preseason and we're getting ready for conference play and we kind of go down to Florida, you know, we make a couple of mistakes and all that. Then we start going into some, you know, uh, regional games and stuff when we return. I always tell the players the last two or three years, I'm always like, guys, if you play like you played today, we can win a conference championship, right? But you still got to win a lot of games to get there. But now seeing that, you know, they were ranked, 
Um, they made it to the World Series and they did what they did in 2023. I think in 24, they actually believe like, hey, you know what? We can compete with the best. You know, before it was so far fetched, like, oh, let's make it to the World Series. And you're thinking, OK, well, we're not even winning the conference. Right. Well, now they're competing against the top 10 in the country and they're winning and they're beating them. So now they know that we belong on that stage. So it just makes them more hungry to want to get back. Yeah. And the interesting thing, Coach, is that last year, you started your Florida trip last year. Your first two games were against Nova Southeastern, yep. <laughs> and you played them in Chattanooga. Now you're going to play them again sure. as part of your Florida trip, which is so fascinating to me because Coach LaMare, she's kind of built that program in Nova Southeastern, how you've been building up your program in ESU. So how does the Florida trip kind of serve as that baseline for where okay. you see your team going forward in 2024 and how you can kind of get them on that path to eventually sure. hopefully end of the season in Florida for the World Series. Sure. I think the schedule we play in our preseason down in Florida, which we usually, um, you know, we do the double headers down in Miami against some really good competition. Um, I think that, you know, really challenges us because we don't always come back with wins from that trip. You know, we're only three weeks into practice and we're throwing right in the fire to play some of the top teams, right? You know, it's, it's always tough competition down there. Um, but I think it was really cool to see that we competed with like Nova, but we lost to them in preseason. But look at the gradual, like, you know, the gap that we closed and got so much better that by the time we played them in the World Series, we've pulled everything together. And that was like, we reached a height, like we hit a peak. Um, so I think going into them now, it's like, well, we know we can beat them, but we may not be ready, but we're going to give it everything we got. Um, you know, preseason is to challenge them. I think our schedule this year is very tough. Uh, we're playing a lot of ranked teams or teams that play, you know, uh, or compete at the top in their, in their conference. And we want to play the best. It, it makes us better. Uh, because when the speed of the game is faster, then we can see the holes, right, in our game and try to close those gaps, whatever they may be, whether it be in the circle, whether it be hitting, whether it be a, at a position. We've got to, you know, train to make those, those, uh, uh, you know, positions faster or close that gap. So um, I think it really helps us going into conference play to, to play such a tough preseason conference, non-conference schedule. And plus the regional games as well. You got Wilmington on your schedule. You got Malloy on your schedule. Tournament team, St. Thomas Aquinas as well, who made a tournament for the first time last year. Those games are the ones that are going to help get you battle-tested. But when you start in the PSAC in March, and as you referenced earlier, in the, earlier Coach, in the interview, those PSAC games are going to be games where you have to be ready to play seven innings or more every game. Otherwise, you're going to get knocked off. If the, if the tournament is any indication – your players have that understanding and that thought process. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think it's pretty easy for the athletes to get up with conference games. They know the Peace Act's tough. That's why they, you know, uh, you know, choose ESU. Um, the conference is tough. Uh, I, I kind of think more so that, you know, you really want to get the most out of them on the non-conference days because it's harder to get them up for those. Yeah. Yeah. Conference, it's easy. It's the non-conference days. You don't want to lose a game to a team you should beat. Um, you know, so – I think just big picture, though, it's one game at a time. Yeah, of course, we want to get to the World Series, but there's a lot of work to do. We got to focus on just getting into our conference tournament, and that's tough to do to finish top five yes. in your conference. So, you know, you got to start with that first before you worry about the post-play experience. A couple of final things, Coach, before we let you go. With your team, I know you just started the preparation process for the season. What's the one thing that you've seen so far from this team that you feel confident will carry itself throughout the season to hit what the goals that you have set up for your program? I think player personnel, leadership, talent, um, but more so like they come back with just such a, it's always fun after winter break, get a good gauge of like how the team gets along. Um, they come back with so much energy. It's just goofballs right now. It's like, guys, quiet down. We got focus on this. They're laughing. They're making coaches laugh. So I think with that loose energy, that's what we need. Um, you know, because pressure is going to hit us at some point. I got to try to keep things light, you know, big picture. Yeah. You want to win a softball game, but at the end of the day, are they having fun too? Yep. Um, so they, they brought that back with them after winter break. They look good. They're fun. They're loose. 
and they're excited for Florida. That's easy. We don't have to get them up for Florida, right? They want to go. It's snowing here. We can't even get on our field. So that'll be the first time, literally, because we play on turf, but it'll be the first time we literally touch dirt. So it's like a five-year-old going into candy shop. They're so excited to get to Florida, see sun, see dirt. Uh, makes our jobs easy. I, that's why I like to be in the Northeast. I love Pennsylvania. And I say that all the time. I mean, I think if you have a field every single day and you go out and you play on your field every single day, you have nothing to look forward to. Yep. Where we have so much change here. We train in the facility. Then when you're done in the facility, you go out on your field. And then when you're done with your field, you go down south, you see the sun, then you come back and you're like, we're ready. Let's go. So I think there's something to say with the strengths that we have um, when you're not doing the same thing every day. So we're pretty excited. One last thing, Coach, before we let you go. Being a warrior is kind of the mentality of your program. How do you, for those who don't follow your program as much, and there are going to be a lot of eyes on your program after what happened last year. Mm -hmm. For those casual fans, what does it mean to be a warrior and representing East Stroudsburg? I think everything we just talked about, it's not just about being an ESU softball player, but it's about experiencing a really cool place that has a great family um, and support. And I think every player that walks out of here, like, uh, you know, when they graduate, they just like, they love their experience so much. And it's not even about the wins and the losses that, you know, if you can win and have a successful run, that's just a bonus. But I think everything that we do from the academics to the careers they want to be in, um, you know, uh, to all the different things that we get involved in, um, as well as like, all the teams down the wing of our hallway that all are so successful that like, it's fun. You walk around, you feel like a winner, you know, you wear your, your athletic gear and you're all, we're all branded the same. You walk around on campus. Uh, everybody knows each other because you, you know, we have all the same branding. So you know who the student athletes are on campus and you know, our basketball team's hot right now. They're nationally ranked. So you got all our student athletes going to the games. I think it creates for a family environment. We're not all like just, you know, focused on just our NG and our office and our sport. It's such a family environment and it makes it just so, so fun to work in, to be a part of. Um, we're building a community uh, that, you know, is, it goes beyond just softball. Um, and that's what a warrior is. And coach, your warriors are going to come down to Florida in three weeks and try yeah. and get things started again. And hopefully if you do all the right things, you'll end your season as one of eight teams being back in Florida in May. So we are. Hopeful. Yeah, that'd be cool. <laughs> that'll, hopefully that'll take place. Coach, thank you so much for the time. We appreciate it. And uh, we wish you all the best this upcoming season. You got it. Thanks so much. And thanks again to Coach Wallback for joining us, the first coach to get to be on D2 Tuesday and certainly won't be the last. Thanks again to Ryan Long, Coordinator of Athletic Communications for ESU for setting up the interview I had with Coach. Again, that interview took place last week. And East Stroudsburg, you heard Coach mention it in the interview, a lot of great talent returning from Last year's roster led by their dynamic pitcher, Paige Zygmunt, who was phenomenal in that run to get into the D2 Women's College World Series. They got a tremendous offense who will be returning and very dynamic as well. Uh, Denver Shaw Taint, a senior out of New Zealand, transferred from uh, Nene College, will definitely be a vocal point on the offensive side as East Stroudsburg will look to make it back-to-back. Atlantic Regional Championships in 2024. Abigail Warlick as well hit 344 for East Stroudsburg. Now they will have to figure out their offense with a lot of talent. Jada Smallwood also back. Florida native transfer from Maryland. You know nothing. You know Jada will love nothing more to return back to her home state playing for a national championship. In the 2024 season. And Memphis East Stroudsburg will start their season week two. As they'll make their Florida swing. They'll take have double headers with Lynn, Palm Beach Atlantic, and the aforementioned one with Nova Southeastern. That's going to be Sunday, February 11th on Super Bowl Sunday. And then they'll finish their trip to the Sunshine State with a double header versus a very scrappy and uh, under the radar Barry team uh, led by Sean Cotter. That will be on Monday, February the 12th. For full schedule details, go to ESUWarriors.com for more information. 
about the Warriors and what they will be looking to do in 2024. They will start Peace Sack play on the 19th of March at home at Creekview Park as they would take on Kutztown. Uh, that's a 1 and 3, 30, 3 o'clock doubleheader. And then they'll take on Shepard on March 22nd. And then on Saturday, they would take on the PSAC Tournament Champions in Shippensburg. So a very critical portion of the schedule, especially in conference play for the Warriors. Let's continue our trek through the preseason top 25, 11 through 15. You got you, India, number 11, Les Studeman in Alabama, Huntsville. A perennial top tw- top 15 team. They come into preseason polls at number 12. Jason Anderson in Southern Arkansas at number 13. Adelphi comes in tied with Crystal Rosendahl in Concordia. Irvine at number 14. Oklahoma Christian, a team that had a strong start to 2023, rode that momentum to the postseason. They come in at number 16. Wingate is at 17. Aaron Kimberger and St. Leo, they are at 18. Rogers State, the national champions from two years ago, they come in at 19th. Charleston with Michelle Fru off a of super regional appearance, one way away from making it to the World Series. They come in at 20th. 21 through 25, Colorado Christian, Oklahoma Baptist, Columbus State, Mississippi College, and Northwest Nazarene. Round out the top 25 of a programs receiving votes in the preseason poll. Harding, West Alabama, Lenore Ryan, Lubbock Christian, Missouri Southern, Auburn Montgomery, Simona State, and Kutztown, who I referenced previously. They'll kick off the conference schedule with East Stroudsburg in the middle of March. So that's your NFCA preseason top 25. The Lone Star Conference... Lead led the way with three teams each in the rankings, including two top 10 teams, West Texas number four, Texas Tyler number eight, Oklahoma Christian 16 for the Lone Star Conference, over Southeastern number five, Tampa number 10, and St. Leo number, number 18 for the Sunshine State Conference. Four of the leagues with multiple teams in, the Gulf South, the Peach Belt, the Great American, and the MIAA each have two teams in. Season starts Thursday, February the 1st. You want to talk about a loaded opening day on D1 and D2? That weekend, woo! North Georgia and St. Leo, number one versus 18. That's going to be at the Gulf Shores Invitational. Number three, Central Oklahoma. Number 22, Oklahoma Baptist will battle at the Mardi Gras Invitational. Cal State San Marcos, number seven. Takes on number 21, Colorado Christian at the Concordia Clickoff Classic. Number 8, Texas Tyler will take on 17th ranked Wingate at the first pitch invitational. That's going to be taking place at Conroe, Texas. We'll talk more about that tournament and the opening week tournaments on our season preview coming up next week. And also another matchup in the Concordia Kickoff Classic to look out for. Number 16, Oklahoma Christian, taking on number 14, Concordia. Concordia will also play number 21, Colorado Christian. Oklahoma Christian would also play Northwest Nazarene. And then Oklahoma Baptist would take on Mississippi College. So that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 top 25 matchups on opening weekend of the Division II season. So exciting times coming up in the Division II landscape. And we'll break all of that down coming up on our D2 season preview extravaganza that will be coming up next week. Speaking of that extravaganza, next weekend, you already made me make one. You already heard me make one announcement that we'll be joined by Nova South Eastern head coach Julie LaMare on next weekend D2 season preview. Also, set to join the proceedings next week, the latest inductee to the NFCA Hall of Fame, Augustana head coach Greta Melstead, will join us on a D2 season preview next week. And also, we're making efforts to have a conversation with North Georgia head coach Mike Davenport. We have sent the email out to him. 
And that's not including the other coaches who we've also reached out to and setting up interviews with them to get us ready for the 2024 season. So, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to be ready to launch D2 Tuesday into the stratosphere with the season starting on next week. You just heard some of the matchups. And we are going to officially start the road to Longwood. I'll think of some catchy title by the time the up next episode airs. I keep t- I told y'all I would work on that at some point. Based on what all the emails that Eric and I have been exchanging with each other and interviews we've been doing for the podcast, it is going to be absolutely crazy what's going to happen with not just D2 Tuesday, but Inner Circle as an entity. We're really excited to share that information with all of you and be aware of that. On our social media platforms. So that's going to do it for this episode of D2 Tuesday. Thanks again to uh, Coach Jamie uh, Wallback for joining us on East Strasburg. Again, thanks thanks to Ryan Long for setting up that interview with Coach. Next week, folks, already lined up and confirmed. Nova Southeaster head coach J- Julie LaMare already confirmed for next week. Augustana head coach. NFCA Hall of Fame inductee Greta Melstead will be joining us on D2 Tuesday. We may have more coaches lining up to join us on a season preview. Eric Lopez is going to make an appearance, folks. It is going to be a jam-packed D2 Tuesday. So jam-packed, we may have to break it up into two parts, but that's another topic for another day. That's going to wrap it up for this edition of D2 Tuesday. Hope you're staying warm out there. My name is Victor Anderson. I will talk to y'all next Tuesday at the same time, 2 o'clock right here on D2 Tuesday. Top podcasts are out. Good night, Canada. Thanks for watching this latest video. To unlock more content, click on the subscribe button and turn on your notifications. Follow us on social media by clicking at In The Circle SB down at the bottom or download In The Circle wherever you listen to your podcast in the description field.